So good evening, everyone. Um, I am Dorian DeBar, one of your co-hosts for this evening's Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. Um, I'm the president of the Side to Cap Development Authority. And before we get into it, I just wanna um, take this moment to um, also recognize other members of the committee. Uh, we got brother um, Miguel Lloyd of Lloyd Media Group, uh, Rick Makerson of Blue Tech Finn. And then we also have Armand Davis of Paragon Construction Group. Um, so just to briefly recap this series. Um, so we hit it this evening as a part of a seven part series to speak about entrepreneurship and how to position individuals um, to kind of get beyond some of the mistakes that a lot of the folks that we're gonna talk to throughout this series have experienced and just really give you an idea of what it takes uh, to start your own business and maybe even watch your own business grow to a, a different um, level. Um, the 100 Black Men of Atlanta is providing this entrepreneurial speaker series. Um, and it is not designed to be a classroom lecture or provide you with every little step that you need to consider when starting or building a business. Our goal is to highlight and hopefully alleviate common mistakes that often stifle small businesses and contribute to the creation of better prepared entrepreneurs that result in a greater impact on the business and, and also within the community. Um, last month, if you all recall, we discussed how to develop an idea with Brother Barra Cola, um, founder of Cabrice Car Car Carbis Corporation, um, and in this session, we'll be on our YouTube channel soon. Um, next month, we'll discuss how to raise money. But today, I think this is a phenomenal portion of the speaker series. And we're going to talk about the power of relationships. Um, we have a legend that's going to be an individual that's going to really bring it home for everyone. Um, speaking with us today, his brother is uh, named Mac Wilborn. Mac is the owner and president of Mac2. He is also one of the founding members of the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. And his corporation, and his company is, is wide, is large, and it has a great influence within his community. Um, and we look, wanna look forward to hearing from him. Um, but before we bring Mac onto the stage and have him speak, I'm gonna hand it over to Armand, and he's gonna lead us through a deck that just really speaks to why relationships are powerful for entrepreneurs. So Armand, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dorian. Uh, I really won't hold y'all long today because I really am excited to hear what uh, Brother Wilborn has to share with us. But I really just wanna talk a little bit about the power of relationships and how significant they are to you all, to everyone as an entrepreneur. I really think relationships are the thing that connects all of the other topics that we'll be discussing on this series together. Uh, they are really the key to success in really any aspect of life, particularly in business, but even in your personal life as well, uh, you really won't be able to point to a successful entrepreneur who does not successfully grow and manage relationships. So the real question is, so how do you build those relationships? So I wanna kind of touch on a couple of things a couple that uh, for me have been really integral uh, in terms of how to build and grow and manage relationships uh, as an entrepreneur. Uh, next slide, please. So something that a lot of people don't think about when they're talking about building relationships is really the proper application of empathy. Now, a lot of people confuse empathy with sympathy. And I always tell uh, people who I coach in business people who I work with, I mentor, that empathy is not sympathy. And so the way I would say it is that sympathy is if some you see something happen to somebody and you say, oh man, I feel really bad for you. Or, oh, I feel really happy for you. You know, but if you feel really, if you feel it, it's something that happened that you're looking at through your lens, through your eyes. Empathy is the ability to actually view things through the eyes, through from the perspective of the other person. So if you wanna have and establish powerful relationships, then you have to be able to be empathetic with the people who you're in these relationships with. You have to be able to look through, at things through the lens of their eyes, through the lens of their experiences. This will help you as you continue to be a solution provider for, uh, for everyone with whom you're in these relationships. So you have to really be able to understand things from their perspective. It doesn't mean that you have to have done everything that they've done, 
but you do have to be able to step within, step out of yourself within the eyes of the other person and look at the problem and look at the situation through their eyes. If you can do that, uh, and if you can do it sincerely, then the other party will really be able to pick up on that. That will help you to foster a strong connection and to build that relationship. Next slide. The next thing, the, the next key to me is, is, is really listening more than you speak. So a lot of people, particularly as entrepreneurs, particularly when, you, when you're up and coming, you, you're so proud, you're so excited about your product or your service, and you get in a room and you find that you're doing most of the talking. And I always say, uh, you need to listen more than you speak. You know, our grandmothers used to tell us, right? God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's really something that you really should carry with you throughout your entrepreneurial journey. If you can successfully listen uh, more than you speak, then one, your words will carry more weight, <laughs> right? Uh, and also being an active listener. And there's a difference between listening and being an active listener, right? So you know, you can sit there and stare at somebody and just because you're not talking doesn't mean that you're listening. And so and when you try to be an active listener, you are listening with a focus and an intention to understand the person who's talking, not just to hear them, but to understand what they're saying and the source, the root behind what it is, what they're saying. When you ask questions, you aren't asking questions to get to your own end. You're asking questions to help them get to their end. I think that's a major key and a major, uh, a major aspect of building, uh, of building relationships. When you combine this with empathy, with what I talked about on the last slide, with being empathetic, you're really well on your way to building strong and powerful relationships. Um, and then the final piece, like I said, I don't want to go go too long because I really want to hear what Mr. Wilborn has to say is, and this is how I approach any relationship, any business relationship that I come in. The first thing in my mind, and sometimes you may even hear me actually say it out of my mouth is, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? Because if you come into a situation and the first thing you're doing when you're talking is talking about everything that you need and everything that you're trying to do, well, that doesn't actually foster a strong relationship. In order for a relationship to be strong, right, there has to be a mutual benefit there. And so you can't, even though you are in a position, like we'll talk in the next session about raising capital, although you are in a position where you need money, right, you have to begin from the perspective of how what it is that you bring to the table can serve the needs of the people in the room. And, you know, you guys have probably heard the term servant leadership being used uh, on multiple times. And being a servant leader is something that's actually very difficult to do because you might not always be the person that's out front. You might not always be the person who gets the credit, but when it comes down to it, the people that are in the room, the people who are in the most important rooms know that you can be relied upon. They know that you are empathetic. They know that you listen with intent and they know that your intention is to provide, is, is to serve the people that are around you. And that's what makes it so powerful. Um, the other aspect of it, when we talk about service in your community, this is also extremely important. This is also something that's extremely important to us here in the 100 Black Men. Um, by serving within your community, you also help to foster real relationships with the community and to bring people from outside of your community into your community in order to provide assistance. And so that's really, really brief. Like I said, I, I coach and I can go, I can go for an hour on the power of relationships. Um, but if you keep those things in mind, be empathetic, 
being an active listener and come in a spirit of service. You get out of it what you put in, what you, what you put into it. So if you provide your service, people will want to serve you if you're serving people. So be prudent about what and who you choose to invest your time in and your energy in. You plant your seeds that grow and prune your relationship tree often. A lot of us would know as, as you get older, you know, when we were all 20, 20 years old, we, all, we, we probably had 10, 15 people we considered to be friends. We might've had more than that. I had a bunch of line brothers. I thought all my line brothers were my friends, you know? And as you get older, you realize as you go to different, uh, as you go to different phases in your life and you move to different phases in your business with things, then you're gonna have to prune that relationship tree. And there are gonna be some people that will be moving in along their path adjacent to you and you'll keep those people and there'll be other people who for whatever reason um you may have to continue to move on from i'm not going to say leave behind as if you're above them but you may have to take a different path and there's nothing personal about that but it's a choice that you have to make uh, as you continue to focus in on your goals so keep all of these things in mind uh as we uh as we continue to move through the series but understand that the power of these relationships and how they work uh, will be key and integral to your success as an entrepreneur uh, going forward. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Dorian to uh, introduce Mr. Wilbur, and I'm really excited to hear from you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Armand. That was a, a great deck, it was a great presentation, a lot of great gems within there, um, and look forward um, to to definitely talking to Mac. But before we get there, let me say this. It ain't easy to introduce Mac. I mean, this is a, a phenomenal brother, man. I mean, instead of saying the power of relationships, it's really say the power of Mac. And I will tell you, we have all somehow or another been touched by Mac in some form or fashion. So if you've been to Atlanta airport, if you touch one of those Coca-Cola vending machines, that's Mac. He manages that. Um, has a Popeyes, not a Popeyes, several Popeyes within Atlanta uh, airport as well. And just across the board, just a phenomenal individual. So I mean, he got like three pages of accomplishment, so I'm definitely just going to try to get it down to a few tidbits here and then hand it over to him. Um, so Brother Mac is definitely, um, again, phenomenal. Um, he is a native of Magnolia, Arkansas. All right. Um, and he is, again, the owner and president of Mac2, a quick service restaurant management company since 1971. And so remember that date, 1971. And again, he has a host of franchises that he has within Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. Um, he is also the manager partner of M MWJ LLC, a vending company in Atlanta, Georgia. And he has managed the Coca-Cola vending locations throughout the airport since 2004. Um, Mr. Wilborn also started a small angel investment firm where he focuses on startup businesses that could, could potentially compete on the next level with the proper strategic resources and guidance. Um, this firm also serves as an outlet for vetting potential business deals, whether small or large. Um, one of his first jobs as, as a youth was Jack in the Box. I kind of want to hear more about that, Matt, but we, we, I'll give you the, the floor for that one. Um, but again, as I say, remember 1971. So on June 15th, 1971, um, he, along with his partner, Brad Hubert, became one of the first minority McDonald's franchisees in the Atlanta area. Four McDonald's restaurants, over 150 employees, and 21 years later, they sold their McDonald's operations in 1992. Um, while working on the startup of the first Popeye's Chicken in the airport in his Edie's restaurant location at the airport in 1996, um, Matt became an Olympic licensee as a unique color-changing glass and mug wholesaler for the 1996 Summer Olympic Games. I mean, again, just, just through and through, and I really want to focus on this. He has a ton of awards and recognitions throughout his career. Um, I saw somewhere he's been inducted in some numerous Hall of Fames. We won't talk about all of them, but definitely a few. Um, He's a longtime political supporter, has hosted four Democratic presidents, um, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, and President Joe Biden. Um, and again, he also had the wherewithal in helping others throughout the business community. And I just want to kind of speak to this one, but this is always definitely speaking to me with respect to um, giving your time back to the community. Um, so he has served on the, with the Atlanta Business League, the Butler Street YMCA, the Urban League, the NAACP, Zoo Atlanta, MLK Center, the National Black Arts Festival, the Adopt the Streets Program, the Atlanta Tip-Off Club, Brain Injury Association of Georgia, the High Museum and Center for Puppetry Arts, 
the local advisory board of Branch Banking and Tr Trust in Atlanta, numerous youth organizations in local schools, and he is currently the board member of Georgia Primary Bank, the Center Helping Obesity and Children End Successfully, Choices, um, the Piedmont Foundation, the Smithsonian National Portrait Museum, and the Atlanta Business League, and he is a member of the Salem Bible Church. So with all of that being said, again, I just gave y'all highlights. This is a phenomenal brother. I'm, I'm willing to step back here. Yeah, I want to step back. There's nothing more I can add. I want you all to hear from him himself to talk about the power of relationships. So with that, I gladly hand it over to a good friend of mine, Brother Mac Wilborn. Well, thank you. Well, uh, talking about friendship and the whole bit, I can go back to my fourth grade. I know where most of my classmates are from the fourth grade, and which was Arkansas. And then in the 10th grade, 11th grade, I moved to Tucson, Arizona, went to Tucson High. And the president of that class, I went from a class of 22 to a class of 356 students. And I was just put in the Hall of Fame in Tucson two years ago. But the president of that class, Cody Phillips, and I are still friends and we communicate today. Um, so it's, um, and I, when I moved there, I, I didn't know, I didn't know anyone at school, but in two years, I, you know, I failed a few classes like Spanish, uh, and, but I was able to graduate. And then I went to LA to go to junior college and that didn't work. So I go back to the University of Arizona and say, okay, uh, I'm gonna try the university now. So a year, year and a half in, the Dean calls me in and says, you gotta get your grades up, otherwise you're not gonna be able to come back. I said, Dean, I'm gonna do you a favor and me. I'm leaving today. I never went back, moved back to LA, was a friend that I'd met at, at LA Junior College had a jack in the box in Watts. And I asked him for a job. He said, the only thing I have is, is maintenance, washing the windows and cleaning it up. I said, I'll take it. I took it in three weeks. I was promoted to work on the grill. And then I was promoted to be a, a, a swing manager, training, training manager. Um, and from that, I fell in love with fast food. So I looked around and said, okay, who is number one in the fast food world? And it was McDonald's. And at that particular time, there were no black McDonald operators in the system. When our late, great Martin Luther King was assassinated, there was a Reverend Rabbit in Cleveland, Ohio, that started um, asking McDonald's to take in blacks to be operators in the black community. He said, no. So they start, they burn them down. They burn, I don't know how many it was down in Cleveland, Ohio. Ray Kroc said, okay, I get it. So he sent some people in. I flew from LA to New York and had a friend that knew people in Cleveland. And I went and met with the guy, Bob Beavers was a brother that was working for Ray Kroc um, and started talking to him about a franchise. But what I had been doing is, and, and before that, when the first black got to McDonald's in LA, I started working for him at night and I had a day job. And within two years, we were able to get a franchise. Brad Hubbard, we went to the University of Arizona. He was a professional football player with the San Diego. And Ray Kroc had a policy, you had to be married. Somehow I didn't pass that test. I'm still trying to pass that one. but. Uh, he was playing with the San Diego Chargers, but he was looking for a business opportunity. So I, I talked with him. He came from San Diego up to LA. We met and we start putting our package together to get a franchise. They gave us a choice of Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Atlanta. We, neither one of us wanted to go to any of those cities. So we chose Atlanta. Uh, he flew here once. I didn't. I did a sight unseen. I was like one way ticket, and came to Atlanta. I knew 
I had three names. I didn't know anyone. Um, and we were the eight black McDonald operator to come in the McDonald system in 1971. So June 15th of this year would be 50 years of me being in business in Atlanta that I will celebrate. Um, so from there, he and I uh, kind of split up. He went his way, I went my way. I, I had We had two stores at that time. So I was able to grow, he was able to grow. Um, and my third store was 1975 Candler Road, where the library is now. So when I saw when I when I left McDonald's in '92, um, they put that store up, the real estate up for sale. I went back and bought it, and I, and started assembling land indicator, um, and that's how. I ended up with the land, selling it to the county and buying everything around it, where the senior housing is right there now. I had assembled all of that. And down the street, I've assembled another seven. I, I'm, I love deals. I'm a deal junkie. Uh, so I love playing with real estate and investing in deals. So, um, but, so between Stewart Avenue uh, Candler Road, then I did Glenwood, and then I built Panola in 1988 um, and opened that up and did very well. Uh, and, and along the route, uh, the other thing I've been unbelievably blessed in all those stores, if I add up all the times I was robbed at gunpoint, me, that doesn't count the times my managers were robbed. I was personally robbed in the stores at least 15 times. So it's, um, so when I left McDonald's and got in the airport with Popeyes, but I was already in the airport with the retail from, um, with Parodies. I was one of the first minorities under Maynard Jackson. When that airport opened, I was with a company called, a local guy, Parodies, which now is the largest in the world, retail. Uh, so then I switched from retail to food in the airport. And part of it is because of the security of not being on the streets. It can be rough. And from there, I've grown that into eight restaurants at the airport and I'm Coca-Cola's partner uh, in the vending. Um, we have snacks, ice cream, and of course, Coke's waters and all of that. That's kind of my ride. It's an amazing ride. Absolutely. And, amazing ride. Yeah. And um, the bank that I'm on the board of that's up at 3880 Roswell Road, I'm the only minority of color on there. We have Spanish guy, Indian guy. Um, but it was because of my relationship. Uh, with my banker, and I was telling the story yesterday. I have the same banker since 1988, and we we when he started the bank and asked me to be a part of it, make an investment, um, and I did. And I'm I'm a stockholder, a board member, and. We had a little rocky road there in 08. And when I guess between seven and eight, we lost a hundred and ten, I think it's 110 banks in the state of Georgia, if you can believe that. And uh, so it has taken us eight years to get back to where the stock started off at 10. It went all the way down to $4. And now we're back up to almost 11. Uh, so it was a very scary ride. Uh, but, but me and my banker who was there, never we never flinched. And when I needed him after he had left the bank and went with another bank and I needed a loan for the restaurants at the airport, we went to dinner with his president and the chairman of the board. And they gave me a loan the first night they met me to, to build eight restaurants 
at the airport without seeing any financials. So it can be done on relationship. Sir, which Sir, bank is that? that? Uh, the bank I bank with is Iberia. The bank I own part of and is, is on the board is Georgia Primary, which is uh, one bank. But Iberia was Georgia, uh, it was a Cumberland bank up at up, uh, near Cumberland Mall at that time. And uh, he, had bank, he had worked with these guys out of uh, Houston. They had all moved here from Texas. Um, so he went back to work for them. He had started his own and it didn't work, but he went back to work for them. And, but he, when I needed money, I mean, and we were real, we were, we're friends. We go to the wine country together and all of that. Um, so, mm -hmm. so, so, and that's, and that's wonderful to hear Megan. So I think if what. I, you know, I think one of the things that's phenomenal when we always talk, like you always have a great story and a great um, discussion about just relationships and how it's definitely um, allowed you to help others and also help prepare your own business, right? So can you think of another example whereby maybe that relationship helped you um, take your, your business in, in, to the next level? Um, and even if you want to even speak to, because I know you got a lot of stories, you got, you got a great relationship with, with Maynard Jackson, um, just kind of give us some of those. Well, yeah, Maynard was amazing. When I moved to Atlanta in 71, we was, we garbage collectors had to walk to the back of the house. You know how far some of the houses can be from the street and put that garbage on their back, bring, bring the can out and dump it and then take the can all the way to the back of the house that was the first thing I saw the first morning. I was at hotel at, at uh, Howell Mill and I-75. I came out of my room, hotel at six. And that's what I saw. Maynard changed that immediately when he became mayor. He, he would ride around and check if there was a pothole, he called it in. I mean, when he, he would write down and call it in himself. Uh, he was a, I mean, even down to things like the red lights of synchronizing them. He was a, just a true manager. Uh, and, and everywhere he went, if you was a garbage collector, you could be president of the bank and he's gonna treat you the same way as he would treat the garbage guy. Uh, I, the, the, another amazing story, when he called me one day and says, okay, I want to, um, I'm, I'm putting the banks on notice. I'm gonna move all the city's money out of town if they don't put a minority, start putting minorities on the bank board. And the late governor, Carl Sanders, who was ex-governor, had started a bank. And he was the first one to step up and says, okay, I'll take somebody. And they asked me, but I knew I, I really wasn't ready for no bank then. And so I, I knew a guy named, um, gosh, my brother. Anyway, he had worked at C Citizen Trust. So I, I recommended him. He went on that board and then we ended up with blacks on every board in Atlanta. Then there was another situation. Uh, it used to be a group they called, uh, wow. It was a black and white group that got together every once a month. And you had all the big guys, Portman, um, from Portman down and from Herman down. But most of our black organization, like Linda Way with Urban League and all of that, we would be, the first meeting, I finally got invited to be in there. And I never will forget, I went to that meeting and I felt like I'd been chewed up and spit out. Uh, I never went back. Uh, but Herman was the only somebody that could stand up in the meeting because we as Afro-Americans that were in there, we that if we had a nonprofit, we were, we were trying to get money for that nonprofit. Uh, and, and we couldn't say nothing. So it, you were strapped. And I still say, um, when I look at some of the experiences I've had, I went to McDonald's 
vice president, um, vice chairman of the whole McDonald's system and got a site on Martin Luther King approved at Griffin Street that I wanted to build a McDonald's and the corporation approved it. The chairman, the president of the school, and this was in the 80s, he wanted $4,000 a month for rent for an acre of land that's still vacant today, okay? Uh, and I was like, if you let me do this and put the training school, because they had a restaurant division at the school. So I said, we can merge that in. I, I can bring Coke. You can get some endowment. They couldn't see it. Uh, so it's been, you know, some experiences like that, that it's a little hard. And then on, on that same note, I, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Tom Joyner, went and tried to talk to, and was gonna put a lot of money, like 15 million in. And they told him he couldn't have no say so. So he walked. So I've, I've just kind of been in the room with a lot of situations of, of wow. like that. Oh, go ahead, Miguel. No, I was I'm just astonishing uh, to hear stories like that. Uh, one thing you, I, I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak a few times, and one of the things you mentioned uh, was that you liked to get into the franchising business because of the systems and you love to follow systems. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about how that has helped you to be so successful throughout the years? Yeah, well, what happens is when you go into a branded concept, um, you have guidelines and you have buying power because that brand has buying power that they're already buying. Um, they have system. My, my best example of that is when I left McDonald's, I was really trained and, and I, I always went out in the neighborhood. I went to schools. I used to go to Columbia High in Decatur and take a cash draw teaching kids. If I gave them a dollar and the order was 47 cents and they couldn't give me two quarters and three pennies back, I was in the school teaching that because in my McDonald's, I could not, I wouldn't hire you if you couldn't do that. That was a test before computer that told you how much that, but I, I took it to that extreme. Um, and then once I went into Popeye's, but let me tell you my Popeye story. I was wanting a Popeye restaurant. The chairman of the board was at the Butler Street why downtown he was the guest speaker i had never met him before it was a guy named leon who worked with him and told me he was going to be there so i go and get in line we have we're getting ready he's the guest speaker we get in line i tell him i said i would like i have a location in the airport your corporation does not have one and they had just bought popeyes and moved it from new orleans here and i said i have the money uh i have the management and I want a deal on marketing. I cut one of the first deals because marketing was 4%. I was able to get it for two, still there today. Um, then I said, I'm not going to your school. I was trained by Ray Kroc. Um, you can train, I'll send all my managers. Wow. We shook hands on it the next morning. I walked in the office, opened up the franchise. Then they let me I took my McDonald's experience because I was at McDonald's when we started breakfast. Popeye's had a great biscuit. So, you know, me being a good old country boy, I knew, I, I said, can I put in grits, hash browns, took that piece of chicken and put it in that biscuit and added sausage, did everything I did at McDonald's, added coffee. Uh, I was, the, the, by the time breakfast is over, I, I was doing as much by breakfast ending at 11 o'clock as most stores on the street did all day. So uh, in two years, I'm number one in the system. Uh, then there was another store that came available and it was half the size. 
I opened it up, it became number two. It was only 450 square feet. Corporation said, well, we can't get the equipment right um, because you have to have a certain equipment. But one Monday we sent the numbers in and they said, we don't believe your numbers. I said, well, you know, send me my royalties back. You know, you don't believe my numbers, then I can send you some numbers. Uh, so I've been able to do things like that. And I was number one and number two in the world with Popeyes for years, at, at least 10, 10, 12 years. And I enjoy. And that's phenomenal, man. Um, so if we don't have any questions in the chat, um, I think Armand had a question he wanted to, to ask you. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Brother Wilbur, for, for even, you know, gracing us here with your presence and your story. Get out of here. I just, I, I'm, I'm in awe over here and, 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 and see a, a lot of things that I'm, you know, going through and interested in. And I wanted to hear, get your insight on and hear your perspective on one, um, as it relates to being involved in multiple types of businesses, mm -hmm. um, being involved in real estate, which I'm involved in both on the, from the investment side and on the construction side. Um, and then also how you've been involved in the restaurant business. And I'm sure you've probably been involved in some other sectors and, and, and industries. And so one of the things that I get run up against a lot of times is people say, well, you just need to pick one. <laughs> you just need to pick and just do that. So I no. want to get your thoughts on that and also what it's like and how you have dealt with being in a room with people who don't necessarily see your vision. I don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gone. That's, that's real easy with me. Um, yeah, no. Uh, and, and, you know, my word is my bond. You know, and if you can't take that, you know, you can get all kind of contracts and all of that. And we, we do contracts. I'm a, I'm a believer in them. But at the same time, um, if we can lay it out, you know, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Well, I would say, I would say, for example, with, with, with real estate, there's so many moving parts, particularly in commercial real estate, in terms of as an invest, as an owner. Um, like what? Give me an example. Well, if you got a property that uh, is uh, needs to be a mixed use property, and you got space for for residential and retail, but you also need to put some office space in there, um, then each of those segments have their own characteristics, their own uh, uh, things. And oftentimes, you got lenders that want to lend on one and don't want to lend on another. Right. Uh, and so you got to manage that. Then you got also got to manage the developer and the contractor, the contractors. And then you also got to manage it, you know, the end users, you know, the, the customers that are coming, the tenants that are coming in there. Um, so, yeah. yeah, you yeah I've been lucky there. Uh, like, I bought a, a corner at, at um, North Avenue and um, uh, Pont in the Monroe, Monroe. Uh, and I had three acres there, Herman and I, I got together. We built the strip center and then he wanted to do a, a hotel behind it, but it was like a weekly where you rent by the week. Uh, the strip center, we ended up with national tenants, except one. Uh, then the, the hotel uh, we built, it was a weekly rental. Uh, long-term stay basically and it didn't do well and I just said hey you can have my side my my per percentage I'm gone and so I turned it over to him but we kept the strip center I like commercial I like commercial more than I do yeah and I, I guess I own seven acres there on the corner of Candle and Glenwood now and um and um, in, uh, in downtown East Point, Hapeville, my company where my corporation is, uh, we own the building and, and we, uh, we use that to support the airport and support any other businesses that I'm in. 
this stuff. Right, we have a question stuff. there in the chat there. Um, it says, if Mac was starting a business today, what business would he start? What are his thoughts on the growth of e-commerce and leveraging technology in business? Well, I'm not, I don't, I'm not smart enough to do no technology, but one of the things you have to like, uh, you have to, it has to fit you as a person. That's one of the things that I definitely believe in. I, I wouldn't go into a business that I don't like, or it doesn't like me. It's very hard. And, and the other thing, business-wise, I've never in my life, out of my 50 years, I don't mess with the government's money, meaning my sales tax or my payroll tax. I never, ever touch it. We opened up underground. I was a, the Rouse, Herman and Russell and I was the Rouse partner when we opened up underground way back under Andy's administration. The Rouse company, which built Perimeter Center, uh, Andy went and met with Mr. Rouse. He came down here and we opened up. I worked with I would try to have meetings with some of the minority brothers and sisters that own restaurants in that business, in that underground Atlanta, to just tell them some of the pit holes. They would send their managers. So I finally said, bump you. Okay. Uh, I mean, they were, and then within 15 months, most of them were out of business. But because what happened is when they went into the, we opened in May, by June, by July, by August, sales was this. September came, sales did this. Summer was over and cash flow went down. You gotta, you gotta be ready for the ride. It's like riding a roller coaster. You just said something I'd love for you to expound on. You said you don't go into business, you don't, you don't, you don't start businesses you don't like. But you also said you said you don't start businesses that don't like you. Was that a joke? I don't think so. I think you probably meant something there. To, to expound on that for us a little bit as entrepreneurs. Um, well, if it doesn't like, if it doesn't fit you, you if you don't, you, I don't, if it doesn't work for you, or you can't make it work, then you 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 you're you're bumping your head yeah um, i um uh, it's like it's like i i i and being in the retail business i didn't i never or selling newspapers books and things at the airport that that wasn't i in a partnership it worked because he was very good at buying i we were in uh japan or somewhere shopping and this guy was ordering like a million units of nuggets or whatever to sell. But he had other stores across the country. But he was narrowing it down to a quarter of a penny of he was asking for that kind of discount. But when you think about a million units, it adds up. Smart. Yeah. Hey, Mike, this is Richard here. I have a question for you. Um, as far as building relationships and how you go about business, um, for lack of a better term, like I deem it like very old school, you know, look somebody in the eye, shake hands, break bread. Um, can you talk a little bit about the impact that the pandemic or COVID may have had on either growing or starting new relationships and how or if you have to change when you think about um, you know, the future of the next few years about, you know, the best way to build and maintain relationships? Uh, what I've done is just work to hold on to what I have and not trying to do a lot of um, new things. Uh, it might have been some investment in, I bought some land in East Point, uh, the little center. Uh, but starting anything else um, and other than the things I already own, I, it's just been the whole long because um, money, because I already had notes up to here <laughs> for the airport. And I, 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 I had to remodel, I guess, four of my eight units 
Uh, so that was a note. I already had a note. Uh, so cash flow went this because we closed down, but I was blessed to have such a good relationship with my bank that they was like, let's, let's uh, just pay interest. So we were able to just pay interest and not have to worry until it started to come back. And now it's back and now it's back and we don't have any employees. I've been on from President Biden to our senators and all. Um, and I was glad to see um, um, our governor saying, you know, but it started with some other governors in other states that said, hey, I mean, even Delta's having problems getting employed. Now, if Delta's having problems, my little ass is, you know, really up the creek. Uh, and, but the airport is, is, is there. I, I, I can't even, I can't even um, uh, staff enough to run all my restaurants right now. Or nobody can. Airport or no airport. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Hey, Mac, you mentioned something that, that I wanted to kind of touch on. Um, you mentioned um, Biden. So, you know, one of the conversations you and I oftentimes has is just about how you've been able to host all these phenomenal individuals uh, within Atlanta. And, and I kind of want to understand what the value add is in doing that and kind of what is um, the ultimate goal you see in hosting these individuals and what have you received out of it? Well, I mean, it's to be able to tell them, you know, you, you have them in your home, you be able to tell, you, you, you get to get them in the corner uh, and, and talk to them about whatever your goals are, whatever you see uh, the country needs. Um, and that's what I've been able to do with that. I mean, I mean, I was, I was, I worked on Maynard's first campaign in 1973. I worked from there, working on his campaign. When Andy, when we were able to talk Andy into running for mayor, because he didn't really want to run, we were able to talk him into it. He asked me to be, to, uh, be his co-finance director and the, and the other person was it was only about five whites that supported Andy at a level. John Portman, uh, the president of Riches at the time, uh, Charlie Lottermilk, who is Aaron Rents, who's a billionaire. Uh, he wasn't a billionaire then, but he became, and he and I became chair of, of, uh, of the finance committee. And um, and I don't have I don't have a problem asking people for money, <laughs> uh, and 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 I don't have a problem in writing a check. So I've always been giving back in that aspect. Um, it's like let me give y'all a real example. Last Saturday we buried a legend here, C. T. Martin. Things were a little shaky. So I'm having a couple of few people out that promised they were going to help with the service and haven't came through a week later. I'm like, when you were when you were when you were down there asking him to vote on something, what did you do? So it's that th that kind of credibility is, and people forget. I mean, too quick to me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I, I you know I really don't know where our community is going, especially if I say Atlanta. You all, the cab is is running smooth, I think, from where I sit. Uh, Atlanta is, and I don't know where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. So so Mac, you say so. Let me and and I want to hit this hit this question as best I can. So. It's not an accident that you know politicians. It's not an accident that when Joe Biden was thinking about running for, for president, he thought of you when he came to Atlanta. It's not an accident you know all of these phenomenal individuals and you've been in a, a lot of these rooms and you yourself being phenomenal. So how do you get to that point when building real genuine relationships? It doesn't happen 
when you're at a, a meeting and you exchange business cards. So how does one go about building those genuine relationships? And again, I think you you mentioned, you say the word that that, that resonated when you say being credible, have a credibility, right? I think that's one. But any other keys you can kind of give us with respect to building real long lasting relationships? Well, I mean, it's like, if, okay, if I take Andy Young right now, I probably have one of the best relationships with him from the time he ran for mayor and I was finance. I mean, and we had people like Congressman Maxine Waters that came down here and went to Perry Homes knocking on doors with Andy to help. So I got to know her then at that level when she was a very young congressperson. Uh, and we've, we, we've kept that relationship. She wouldn't come to town and not call me. I wouldn't go to LA and not call her. I wouldn't go to DC and not call her. It's just being that person and introducing, um, I mean, to that's, that's just what I do. Yeah, and, and I tell you, you do a great job with it. Um, again, we, we've met a few years ago and we've had a great relationship since, man. And I definitely appreciate you. Um, do we have any more questions? All right, doesn't seem like it. So Mac, again, I want to thank you for your time, brother. This has been phenomenal. Any more parting words before I, I close us out from you? Uh, we need to, everybody need to look in the mirror and say, where are we going in our community in Georgia? Um, I mean, if I go back, I started helping when Maynard left office, he wanted to be Senator. He wanted to be before he became mayor, but we used to go on weekends, Julian Bond, John Lewis, and I headed up a project called 23. We had 23 counties that had 65% Afro-American and no representation on the city, county, or state level, mm. if you can believe that. Mm. So we worked on weekends to change that. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yes, yeah, sir, you're a great example of, of businessmen who stay engaged in the community because Everybody has to play their position. Everybody has to play their role. And your level of influence and, and, and connections is needed, right? We know a lot of politicians, they don't make a lot of money. They sacrifice in a lot of ways. They need relationships with people like yourself to get stuff done. So we really appreciate your legacy here in Atlanta. Well, thank you. You know, I just, I, just, I, I, I don't mind. I like helping. And, and if people are taking care of business, not, it's not, a, it's probably not, well, especially in the metro, it's not a politician that I don't know, but it's a, it's a few that I, I just see them in a way and I'm gone. And, and man, I, that's one thing I really love about you, Matt. You're so humble and modest, but you got stories for days. <laughs> <laughs> but again, thank you so much for your time. I, this is a great uh, discussion. Um, thank you to my, my co-committee members. Um, we, we're putting on a, a wonderful series here and we got a few more in the pipeline for you all. So our next event is going to be June 23rd. We're going to be talking about raising money. I mean, Mac, you're so dynamic. We could bring you back for the raising money piece, um, but we got to give you, give some other folks some shine. Um, right. And so on, on that panel, uh, we'll have a, a discussion with banker and venture capitalists uh, and VC and a founder. Uh, and then that's again on January 23rd. And we're going to have a lot of folks in the room to talk about how raising money how you raise money and why raising money is so important. I think we all understand the importance of it, but how do you get there? That's always been like that gap, especially here in Atlanta and especially for folks of color, how raising money. So I think it's going to be an, another phenomenal one. Um, so with that, again, thank you all for the time. Thank you again to the, my committee members, Miguel, Rick, Armand, another phenomenal performance. Thank you again, Mac. Thank you to Travis as well. Um, so good night and thank you everyone. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.